morning, Grand Center Alliance. Uh, we're coming to you this morning from the, our new mountain studio. And uh, we, uh, we're glad to, to, to have everybody uh, gathering in all the different formats that we have, whether you're at home on your, on your own uh, or just on a device somewhere or whether you're with a few other people uh, or whether you're in one, uh, like the watch party here this morning. And um, so welcome to everybody. And uh, I hope you take all these opportunities that are offered to w for worship and reflection and uh, engage in those. Um, so um, uh, it's, 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 it's a good morning. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of good stuff here planned and uh, yeah, I hope it's, hope it's meaningful and, um, and helpful for you. So let's pray and then we'll get started with our, with our service. Lord, we're grateful for the chance, even as we gather in all these little different ways, I pray that you would give us a sense that uh, even though we're um, apart in, in, in all these different sort of little formats that we're in, uh, that you would just give us a sense of uh, togetherness, the corporate body of Christ as we, as we gather this morning. I pray that just through all that uh, we experience, uh, engage in here this morning, uh, as we reflect, as we worship in song, as we, uh, as we spend some time in the word, and as we pray, that you would meet us, that you would uh, be with us, that your presence would be um, palpable for us as we, as we uh, gather here today. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my 
I know your story. I've read it cover to cover. And I know the storms that will come. The waves will swell and the sky will darken. Though you'll fight against the current, you'll be swept away. You'll feel helpless and abandoned. And you'll wonder where I am in the midst of it all. I know this isn't the way you thought our relationship would work, but my plans are not for my comfort or yours. My purposes are always and only an expression of love. The scars in my hands are proof that love will sometimes lead you directly into the storm. 
Though you can't understand my plans, you can trust in one thing, that I am entirely good. You can't even imagine how good I am, and my plan for you is no different. When you shout asking where I am, know that I am right behind you with my arms wrapped tightly around you, whispering, I will never let go. For you are the pinnacle of my creation and the center of my affection. There will come a day when I will quiet every storm and wipe away every tear. In that day, there will be no more pain or death. But until that day comes, I will be your anchor in this storm. been talking the last few weeks about all the various storms we face in life, particularly this one that we're in the middle of, this whole COVID thing and how it has impacted us. And some of us are uh, uh, getting tired of, of, of hearing about it, uh, but at the same time is still with us and we still sort of are, are, are a part of uh, a lot of this implications and, and, and how it's all working. But also uh, just with the various storms, uh, how God sustains and how he guides us through all of those. And today we're talking about trusting God in the storm. So, so how, do we, how do we trust God in the midst of a storm? And the, the scriptures are just replete with all of these stories and examples and exhortations and encouragements around trusting uh, God. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick out a few of those today and kind of go through just a couple of those things. Now, trusting in God uh, is one of those phrases, uh, one of those ideas. Um, It's one of the most common and powerful themes throughout the scriptures, but at the same time, when we talk about it and when we encourage each other with it, it it has that potential to sound really uh, pithy and, and cliche. And oftentimes, when we're faced with really difficult circumstances, trusting God seems a really far-fetched idea, and it brings with it an idea or a, or a feeling of skepticism, as in, seriously, that's all you've got for me in the face of this awful situation is that I should just trust God? Or how about guilt? I'm just not doing it good enough. I'm obviously not trusting God enough. And oftentimes when this is offered as a solution to somebody's problems, it rings hollow, seeming to minimize the gravity of the situation, sometimes minimizes the depth of agony, of pain that we're going through, and the distress of some impossible decisions. And some of those decisions that uh, we have to face and you have to face at this particular time, some of them are impossible, uh, and yet they still need to be made. And sometimes we wonder if trusting God on, the, you know, uh, on, on one side means uh, sitting back, being passive, not making any decisions at all. I'm just going to trust God, right? And there's a sense of I'm not going to do anything, not make any decision or or engage in any kind of planning or thinking. You kind of get into that, what will be, will be, whatever happens, happens, que sera, sera, a CS, or any, whatever language you want to use for that. Today, I want to get into uh, uh, examining a bit of an interplay between wisdom, trust, and action. It's a mixture of what should I do, your will be done, and here we go. So trust, the way the, bo- the Bible uses it mostly, has to do with where we place our confidence and where we place our decision making, with wisdom as the precursor to that trust and action as the outcome. So we're going to start with wisdom, which is basically having the ability to apply knowledge to, to any particular situation. It has little to do with intelligence, it has little to do with your accumulated knowledge, and more to do with being able to take all the various forms of information that you have available to you, whether that be various, all the various types of scientific information, uh, emotional, social, theological, biblical, spiritual, 
all these sources of information, we are able to sort of uh, bring all those together and, and choose a course of action. So l- wisdom is then linked with following after God, listening to his instruction and his voice. Wisdom is highlighted, especially in Proverbs, where it's contrasted, interestingly, one side, foolishness, folly, stupidity even, and on the other, wickedness. So you have uh, in the middle is wisdom, and if you don't have that, you're kind of in one of these other two camps, uh, f- foolishness, and wic- uh, foolishness or wickedness. Um, verses 20 to 33 of chapter one has some interesting warnings about going it on your own, on ignoring God, uh, ignoring his advice. It says, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them, but whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. And then on the positive side, you get into Proverbs 2 and wisdom has some benefits. Uh, It talks about gaining understanding and knowledge, how discretion will protect you. Uh, It will save you from the wicked. It will save you from uh, sin, particularly in in, uh, adultery, as mentioned. Uh, It moves on, chapter three. Wisdom prolongs your life. It can bring prosperity. It will win you favor and a good name before God and humankind. And then when you get to Proverbs 3.21, you get a culmination of all that is offered to the wise. I'm just gonna read it here for a second. It says, my son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be life for you, an ornament to grace your neck. Then you will go your way in safety and your foot will not stumble when you lie down. You will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked for the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. Now I wanna share with you a little infographic of the, how knowledge and information and wisdom all together and it'll be up here somewhere beside you. But basically what you have is, this, is, the, is the difference between just data and information. You have things like knowledge. Then you have things like uh, insight where uh, you, know, you, have, you have some connecting of the dots, but the insight is nece- isn't necessarily connected. And then you have wisdom where the dots are actually connected in a make sense sort of way. And then you have on this side, of course, all the conspiracy theories, which are, uh, you know, which are great fun, and they're kind of uh, really prevalent these days. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, I suppose if you believe in the conspiracy theories, you don't know that they're out there. So the second one, though, is trust. Wisdom is the precursor to trust, but trust is rather meaningless in the, con- in the, in the context of laziness, unpreparedness, foolishness, much like hoping you'll be fine if you jump out of a 10-story window or praying that, God, please bless these cheesies to my body's use or let these deep-fried tater tots give me all I need to serve you today. Wisdom, which encompasses knowledge, experience, listening to God's voice and scripture is the essential bedrock of trust. So you need it uh, in order for trust to actually sort of uh, mean something. So, I've been talking about this a little bit. What, what kind of images come to mind when you hear the word trust? To me, it brings up images of a settled, a settled heart, uh, peace in the midst of anything. Uh, think of a child and the protective wing of a parent, safe, secure, generally only as scared and worried as the parent is. Trust is like you and your mechanic friend having car trouble on the highway. It's a situation that you're not too worried about because the friend is there. It's learning a skill in the presence of someone who knows it well, like learning rock climbing or scuba diving from someone who's still alive. It's, it's hearing that star's ambulance that has been called to come to your aid after an accident. It's knowing that you got the best ER doctor on call that night, you had a medical emergency. It's having that patriarch or that matriarch in your family who holds everything steady, who prays for the whole works of you and, and, and keeps everything sort of on course. That's kind of the images that come to my mind when I think about trust. So Proverbs 3, 5 to 8 
which says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. So trusting God makes your ways straight, it brings health to your body, it brings blessing of under, the blessing of understanding. Psalm 20, there's a prayer here that's, that's, that's given, and I want to read it for you. It says, May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give victory to the king and answer us when we call. You have here the psalmist praying that God would answer when we're in distress, that he would send help when, we're, when it's needed, that he would protect, that he would give the desires of our hearts. He prays that the Lord would give victory and that he would answer with the victorious power of his right hand. But what does that actually mean? Because when you're cornered in a park by a group of menacing thugs, does it mean somehow that God shows up in a burst of light and uses some sort of you know, martial arts against them? Or what about if you're in a situation where you're facing sickness, death, financial ruin, the abuse of a child, domestic violence, all the situations where one is rendered powerless and at the mercy of somebody else's ill intent. What, does these, what, do, what do these kind of verses about uh, God giving us all these good gifts when we trust in him, how does all that jive with these kinds of realities? What does it mean to trust God in the midst of suffering? Because even for all the verses in the Bible around God protecting those he loves, it's obvious that in some ways he doesn't always, that many of us are not, fa- are not spared harm at all. And in fact, many in our midst suffer more than what we would consider their fair share. So we're left having to reconsider what victory in our context means. And if at times we suffer hardship, sometimes quite severe, what does victory mean in that setting? The unfortunate truth is that for most of us, at some point or another, we face the fact that our our concept of God is too small. We see him as this cosmic sort of Santa offering this and that as needed to keep us going and keep us safe. And for a while, our infantile faith needs this type of direct, tangible, real interventions. But after a while, we begin to realize, and as we mature in our faith, our, our faith, that God shows up in suffering as well. But he's not there necessarily to shield from all pain. He's other things in mind, such as growth, development, and any other of his own purposes that he has as he engages in this process of redeeming the world. There's this interesting verse that I, that I, that I, that I read through earlier. It says, some trust in chariots, and some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some rely on might in all of its various forms. National military might through your own personal physical strength, your intimidating stature and speech, your own personal access to weapons, uh, your MMA training. We, we, we like to... We like to sp- find security and, and to sort of dispel insecurity uh, in our lives uh, by, by creating and relying on, uh, in some ways, might. And in the context of this verse, the reference is to military might where people take comfort in their perceptions of the relative power that their country holds military, militarily in the world. We also have 
biblical images, of course, of God as, as warrior, uh, fighting battles. And, and it's hard not to take that literally in my own life uh, in terms of God fighting against what I've determined as my enemies. And there are times, of course, when we mix together all these images and cultural values around winning and warfare and being powerful and defeating our enemies, our national enemies sometimes. And the problem is, as a Christian, you have to ask, who is my enemy? In the story of the Good Samaritan, this is essentially the question, but the question's phrased differently. It says, who's my neighbor? And to whom do I owe some responsibility to in terms of care and compassion? And Jesus says, it's your enemy. The very one that you may be have fantasized about God subjugating them and destroying them in some way. So, so who are all these enemies that God is fighting? And even in Revelation, where you have this stirring image of Christ returning on a white horse with a sword in his mouth, what is he conquering? I think it's worth sort of asking that because over and over the enemy in the scriptures is sin and death and the conquering is done not through power and might but through sacrifice. Christ's death, the slaughtered lamb. There's a picture of this in Revelation chapter five. Revelation chapter five, verse five. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed, and he is able to open the scroll and his seven seals. And then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. So what, it's interesting here, what John sees is, is different than what he turns around and sees. Uh, so what he hears and sees are different. Con- and I think, it, I think it's a really neat image, because God when it comes to the kingdom of God, is constantly blowing our expectations around how to do things. In a normal world, to conquer an enemy, you need an army, and a bigger and smarter one at that. In the kingdom of God, Christ, as the spotless lamb, lies, lays his own life down and then is raised and thereby defeats sin and death. And this is, of course, uh, what we term as the already component of the kingdom of God. And of course, there's an a not yet aspect which is yet to come when Christ returns and redeems all things marred by sin unto himself. So some trust in chariots and horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. A quick look through the concordance in your Bible for verses on trust, the concordance, that's the part in the back that you look up different verses, not this sort of the table of contents in the front. Uh, when you do that and you look up trust, there's all kinds of things that humans are tempted to trust in. And I'm not going to read all these verses, but uh, uh, Psalm 44, the bow, as in some kind of weapon. Psalm 44, Jeremiah 49, we trust in our wealth. Psalm 62, trust in ourselves. A bunch of verses about trusting in government and how sort of futile that is. Isaiah 42, trusting in idols. Jeremiah 48, your deeds. Jeremiah 7, your words. Jeremiah 5, buildings and temples we trust in. Jeremiah 9, others. We just trust in other people. Isaiah 8, we trust in the dead. In that verse, I'm going to read it later, they actually say, well, what should we do? Maybe we should ask the dead. The verses go on and on. The reality is, we like to trust what we can see, what we can arrange, what we can purchase, like protection or insurance. The friendships and alliances that we cultivate either on larger political scales or even on smaller scales like in the workplace. And there are stories, especially in the Old Testament, of this happening over and over. And the prophets cry out to their leaders of the day that they need to listen to God instead of trusting in their own power or their own abilities to make deals with other leaders. But you know, over and over, they, they don't listen and they always reap the associated destruction that comes from planting those seeds. So I have a story that I wanna share with you, uh, but I have, to, I have to set it up a little bit in terms of a bit of the history, so hopefully this, does, hopefully this is simple enough. Uh, Uh, Because the story is about the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah and their ultimate destruction and captivity. So after the glory days in Israel, after Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam is not able to keep the nation of Israel together and they split in two. So Israel to the north with its capital Samaria and Judah to the south with its capital Jerusalem. 
Israel to the north was demolished by the Assyrians in 734-ish, and Judah to the south destroyed by the Babylonians a few hundred years later. Uh, as the Babylonians came in, led by none other than Nebuchadnezzar, and you might recognize that name, a large part of both of their demise was this refusal to trust or to turn to and listen to God and instead trying to arrange everything on their own. For Israel and Judah, it meant making and trusting in political alliances, trusting in economic, cultural, political, social structures to help them through. The opposite of all that is revelation. What God says, his revealed presence, his revealed protection, uh, what, he, what he reveals in his word, what he reveals through the prophets, what he reveals through speaking to us. Uh, all of that, ultimately, this kingdom of God that's characterized by things like righteousness, justice, fidelity, but they always choose to trust in something else. The prophet Isaiah, and this story uh, starts in Isaiah 7, 8. Uh, he finds himself pleading and warning King Ahaz. So King Ahaz was king of Judah to the south. Um, he's trying to convince him to trust in God and not in all the political and social structures of his day, but to no avail. Ahaz manages to turn the country of Judah into a vassal state or, or sort of a, 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 a just kind of a puppet state of Assyria. And the cultural forces that the prophet of Isaiah was trying to resist was enormous uh, because it was the political intrigues of the time. A few years before the Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom, there was an alliance formed by Israel and Aram, a neighbor, to try and resist. It was all rather futile. These were really small players, and Assyria was huge. And it was, uh, but, but they wanted Ahaz, king of the south, to join them but of course he refused. So instead to make him uh, join, uh, for some reason they thought it might help to attack him instead. So Assyria is not attacking uh, Ahaz, it's, it's, it's the northern kingdom and some other neighbor. And Ahaz uh, uh, from the south, he responds with fear and he starts scheming with who he should ask for help. And Isaiah comes to him and he assures him that if he trusts in God's presence, then all will be well. And it's literally written like that. It says, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. <laughs> if a prophet came and told you that, you would think that you, that's good advice. Uh, do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Ram, uh, Ramalia, Aram, Ephraim, and Ramalia's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let's invade Judah, let's tear it apart and divide it amongst ourselves and make the son of Tab uh, Tabil king over it. Yet this is what the Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. And then he has some poetic sort of ways of saying this, uh, but we skip to the bottom. If you do not uh, stand, if you do not stand firm in your, in your faith, you will not stand at all. Ahab, or Ahaz, of course, does not stand firm in his faith, and instead he asks Assyria, who was threatening all of them, for help. And Assyria was already on the prowl, they're irritated by all of this, and in all likelihood would have quashed all this anyways, but Ahab, Ahaz's plea for help and his, his tribute, of essentially the freedom of his country, was just a nice bonus for them, because Assyria did help. They destroyed the alliance, they subjugated Israel, but even more tragically, it made Judah, the southern uh, uh, kingdom, a vassal state. Ahaz could not muster the faith to resist the urge to make an alliance with Assyria, and in the process gave away his country's freedom as payment. And this is an example of trusting in economic, political, social structures of the day, which Isaiah tries valiantly to oppose. He sees through the issue, but to no avail. Ahaz thinks that he's making this brilliant deal. He probably just read a, cop, a copy of Trump's book, The Art of the Deal. But instead, he sold his country's freedom in exchange for not being defeated. Now what Isaiah and the other prophets call for is trust in the revelation of God, in God's kingdom. It's characterized by things like righteousness, justice, fidelity, rather than the systems around us that prop us up. The expectation is that we think in terms of the kingdom of God and we resist 
trusting in our own systems. God has his own plans. We don't need to connive the ways of the world to ensure our own, our own futures. Isaiah 2.22 says, Stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils. Of what account is he? So there's a significant lesson, I think, to be learned here. Israel, deeply entrenched in the cultural structures of their surrounding nations. Hosea, another prophet, as well, he speaks about this as he ministered in a time of economic prosperity, political power, but his pros- this prosperity had brought a huge amount of cultural corruption. They, they depended on harmonious relationships with other nations to sar- thrive and survive. But Hosea, like Isaiah, condemns them for moving their allegiance from God to all these national, economic, social interests and adopting and adapting to the ways of everybody else. And that's relevant for us because Israel bought into the gods of prosperity, pride, power, trade, alliances, and it hits home when we recognize, recognize how similar our cultural situation is to theirs. The lifestyle they chose encouraged greed, passion, Riches, a disregard for human beings, a complacency with God, all the while placing their trust in what eventually turns out to be uh, uh, fickle world economics and political and social safety nets. So the contemporary church as a whole and the individuals within it need to grapple with the current temptation of being intoxicated by cultural, material, political achievements as opposed to the kingdom of God which is all about trust, righteousness, justice, humility, love. It's about something totally different. And it's so tempting to think that that's all there is. The values of the kingdom of God are possible to a spouse today, especially when contrasted with social, political values of our times. So instead of relying on governments, our own economic potential, power, politics, which all just continues to breed greed and oppression and disregard for life and injustice. We rely on the values consistently held up in Scripture as those of the kingdom of God, like righteousness and peace and love and mercy and justice and fairness and concern for others. Some trust in chariots and horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. In Isaiah, chapter 8. This is how Isaiah describes the difference between trust in God and trust in everything else. He says, this is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place For both Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind bind up this testimony of warning and seal it upon God's instruction among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Here am I, the child, and the children that God has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. And then there's this interesting little tag on the end of this where the people wonder maybe we should consult the dead for what to do. We could use a medium and maybe ask them. And Isaiah says, When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who m- whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. So that's the first two bits. Wisdom, trust. The third, action. The outcome of all of this is the outcome of wisdom backed by trust is action. Now as preachers and teachers, we're always taught to bring the sermon home and to land the plane. As far as taking all these abstract ideas, theology, lessons from scriptures, translating them into some kind of actionable item for you, the, the listener, bringing you the application of how to and make it really practical. Um, and, and, and sometimes what I think is practical, people have told me that's not, that's not practical at all. But this particular subject is difficult to make concrete and specific for each of you because I've had to outline two concepts so far. One, we're tasked with pursuing wisdom. 
And this entails using all the sources of information we have, scientific, spiritual, biblical, etc., to make the best decisions that we can. God has given us the ability to think, plan, organize, learn, gain experience, and we shouldn't squander those gifts and those abilities and relinquish our responsibility to use our heads, essentially. And two, we're to trust God in all things, not leaning on our own understanding, not trusting in our wealth or our ability to create comfort and security for ourselves and, or, or with earning power, uh, or the ability to, to, to buy security, like insurance, not leaning on governments and armies and stock markets and real estate markets, not relying on economic and social systems created to keep us from harm. And don't misunderstand, all these things are good in their own ways and we make use of them. Like you might be of taking advantage of, of Serb, but you still trust God for your daily bread. But that's not where we take, that's not where we place our confidence. So how does all this translate into the difficult decision or circumstance you have before you? And I've said that trusting God entails three things, wisdom, trust, and action. And if you're being passive or avoiding all the hard things in your life, that's no more trusting God than scrambling and conniving and manipulating things to quell your insecurity. So I can't, I can't tell you what decision to make, or even if that decision is right or wrong. I can't tell you flippantly to just trust God because that negates our responsibility to pursue wisdom and actually uh, engage in action. What I can tell you is that when we ask for wisdom, when we settle ourselves in God, and when we ask for direction, he gives it. Our task, our responsibility, the part, the part that we can control is, that, is in the asking and is in the listening. So nowhere are we encouraged to not be smart about our lives. What we are encouraged to do is to place our confidence in God, to listen intently and put all of our best decision-making mechanisms to the issue or the problem and then get moving. Jeremiah 6, 16 says, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said we will not walk in it. So how do you trust God in the midst of storms or even in the midst of bounty uh, like, like Hosea? We stand at the crossroads and look. We ask for the ancient path. We ask where the good way is. And then we go that way. And our souls find rest. So I want to close. This is the, this is the passage, again, that I want to read to you as, as, our, as our closing bit here. This is Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your ways straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Shun evil. And this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for all that um, you give us. There's times in our life, Lord, that we have various level of need and I thank you that you, sh you, you show up. You, you give us what we need for the moment. I pray that you would give us wisdom to be able to take everything that we need, uh, uh, everything that we have, all of our resources, all of what we are given, all of our ability to listen, and that we would trust in you, that you have our best interest at heart that you have a, a, a way different plan most of the time than any of us do. And Lord, as we do that, that you would guide us into action, things that we actually can do and need to do. I pray that you would be with us in all of that, that you would be comforting us in the process, but that you would help us through it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I want to give you uh, benediction, leave with you a blessing. This is the tradition uh, all, through the, all through scripture and in our church to leave you with something uh, as a, 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 by way of a blessing. And uh, um, sometimes we call that a benediction. But I'm gonna do a little bit of a different one. I wanna read uh, this 
one from uh, Psalm 20. I referenced this earlier. Um, so it's a little different, maybe a little longer than you're used to, but it goes like this. May the Lord answer you when you're in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant you all your requests. Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give victory to the king and answer us when we call. Stretched on his love and- 